Welcome to the webinar, everyone. Increasing Revenue Streams with Smart Backhauling Solutions, hosted by SCS Networks. I'm Laura Noland of JSA, the webinar moderator. Our topic today is increasing revenue streams with Smart Backhauling Solutions, where our panel of experts will discuss the finer technical points and larger business ramifications of satellite-enabled Middle East connectivity. We've got a great group of panelists today. Joining us, you'll see Imran Malik, SES Sales Global Vice President, Hamid Nawaz, SES Middle East and Central Asia Sales Director, and Mohammed Abbas, Public Policy Director for the MENA region at DSMA. We're gonna talk to all of these uh, great panelists in just a moment, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items to talk about with you today. If you have any questions throughout the session, just feel free to type them into our Q&A section throughout the forum. We're gonna do our very best to get to all of your questions through the time we have together today. Or you can also type your questions into the chat and we will monitor those questions throughout the webinar and send them to our panelists. Okay, well, let's get started on our topic for today, increasing revenue streams with smart backhauling solutions. Our panelists today are from SES Networks and GSMA. SES is the world leading satellite operator and the first to deliver a differentiated and scalable geo meal offering worldwide with over 50 satellites in geostationary Earth orbit, GEO, and 20 in medium Earth orbit, MEO. They are a provider of global managed data services to some of the world's largest telecommunications and cloud service providers. SES connects and enables broadcast, telecom, corporate, and government customers to enrich the lives of billions of people worldwide. And kicking off our webinar first is Mohammed Abbas of GSMA. Now, GSMA represents the interests of mobile operators worldwide, uniting more than 750 operators with almost 400 companies in the broader mobile ecosystem, including handset and device makers, software companies, equipment providers, and internet companies, as well as organizations in different adjacent industry sectors. Okay, Mohammed, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Laura. My name is Mohammed Abbas, and I'm calling from Tunis, Tunisia, in North Africa. And as you said, I will be representing the mobile industry. I work as public policy director for GSMA, the MENA region. And before I start, let me please thank uh, the extended SES team for this kind invitation. Um, I'm really happy to be with you here today and to exchange with, uh, with my, my friends. We'll be talking about um, mobile trends in, uh, in MENA region. What is the current situation? What is our forecast over the next four to five uh, years period? And what would be the impact on, on backhaul solution for our mobile operators? So first thing I think we need to start with is to define what is MENA region. Maybe some of our attendees don't know it. MENA region is what you see here highlighted in yellow. It's a 60 hundred million population and it's, it has an interesting, interesting um, uh, geographical location. It sits between Europe, Africa and Asia. It is also a highly diverse region, both economically and techno technologically. Economically, we have countries like the GCC countries, like uh, Qatar, for example, has been over the last decade on the top five worldwide GDP per capita countries. So very rich countries. On the other side, we have poor and very poor countries like Djibouti, Somalia, and others. From technological point of view, we have the Gulf countries, uh, which were the, the pioneer, among the pioneer worldwide to, to assign 5G spectrum, to deploy 5G networks and launch commercially 5G services. And the same for Saudi Arabia, for example, as we speak now, have more than 3,000 uh, 5G beta station operationals, which is amazing even if we compare to, to the larger uh, countries in the developing world. On the other side, we have countries like um, Mauritania, like Iraq, like Djibouti, where the most advanced technology as we speak today is 3G, so not even 4G. So 
one of the lessons I personally learned from working at GSMA over the last four years in the region is there is no one size fits all policy or technology for the region. The whole bunch of policy and of technology, here we talk about, uh, about backhaul is needed in the region since we have that, that, that amazing diversity. Uh, and this naturally leads to a diverse connectivity landscape. As of today, 10 countries in the region have unique subscriber penetration rates of more than 70%. Unique subscriber means if one person has two SIM cards, it counts one, it doesn't count two. We talk about people here. So this is great, 70%. 70%. If, we, if we compare it with the global average of 60%, we have 10 countries doing, doing better. However, there still remains a significant connectivity gap in several countries in the region, six of which have unique subscriber penetration rates of less than 50%, which means in those countries, more than half of population doesn't have a mobile connection yet. Globally, by 2025, there will be more than 600 million new mobile subscribers. 71 million of them will be in MENA. MENA will, new subscription in mobile will represent almost 12% of the global uh, new subscription. Why? As you can see on the left side, Asia Pacific will represent a larger portion of the new mobile subscription over the next period with almost 41%. With MENA, mobile users are increasingly migrating to mobile broadband services, which have become the primary form of internet connectivity given the underdevelopment of fixed broadband infrastructure network in many countries in the region. This is driving a rapid acceleration in mobile data consumption. Among all regions, MENA is expected to record one of the highest growth rates in mobile data traffic between 2019 and 2025. And very soon, in coming few months, 4G in MENA will overtake 3G and will become the dominant mobile technology in the region. And by 2025, we expect 5G connection in MENA will represent almost, almost 6% of the total connection. Those 6% are represented here. We talk about it. Expect almost 50 million uh, 5G connection in MENA region by 2025, shared as you can see between GCC Arab State 18 and 13 in the rest of MENA. Here we see the 5G status uh, as we have it currently now. So we have uh, 5G commercially available for, um, from 46 operators in the world in 25 markets and 79 operators across a further 39 markets have announced plans to launch soon mobile services in the next few months. In red, countries, regions where 5G is, 5G is commercially available now and in blue, countries where 5G will follow very soon. Migration to 5G coupled with better 4G connectivity, uh, enhanced number of mobile application content, affordable handsets, all this will lead to an increase in the smartphone connection globally and in the region. Four in five connection globally by 2025 will be smartphones. In MENA, 74% in uh, of uh, global connection will be smartphones by 2025. This will lead to an increase in mobile data usage, obviously. Global mobile data usage will grow almost by four times by 2025, as you can see on the left. So we'll reach really amazing amounts. We talked today, the average worldwide is per user is 7.5 gigabits per, per month. Will, it will go up to 28. This is really crazy. If a CTO is listening to me, he will tell you, I don't have the network to carry all that data. We need to build a re 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 resilient network. We need to have the proper, strong back, back, uh, backhauling networks to support all this uh, 
huge amount of, uh, of traffic. Uh, in MENA, it will increase by 5.3 times. It will go from 5.3 as current average per user in uh, gigabits per user per month in the region up to 28 also. What we can see here also is that half of world population has a mobile data con has a mobile data connection. What we can see on the left, 3.8 billion people only in the world today are using mobile internet. By 2025, it will go up to five, but still not too much. There is a lot to do. We need to join forces, mobile industry, satellite industry governments, verticals, all we need all to join forces to connect those and, uh, and connect it. Uh, I can say it's a shame today that only half of the global world population is using mobile internet. We need to do, to do, to do more. In MENA region, today we, we have 40% of our population is using the mobile internet and it will go up to 50, 51, 50, 52 by 2025. So we have seen very quickly some insight on the mobile industry as it stands today and some forecast by 2025. Now, what do we need to do to, 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 to answer those challenges? What, what impact on our network, what impact on, on, on the back hole of mobile operators to be able to carry that explosion in, in traffic in the coming very soon period? My next slides will be quickly talking about backhaul and, and then leaving the graph to, to, to more experts than me to talk about backhauls. Let me very quickly explain to some of our audience who don't maybe know what, what is backhaul. Actually, backhaul is connecting points of, of a network. That's, that's the easy way to, to define backhaul. It's a technology that allows mobile operators to connect points of their, of their network. It can be delivered through a variety of wireline and wireless technology, the choice of which depends on several factors such as capacity, cost, reach, latency, and geography. If there is something we don't need to forget from this graph is 1.1 US dollars, trillion US dollars. This is the amount the operators globally will be investing in their network over the next five year period. Almost 80% of that whole capex will be in 5G. You can see a comparison between the regions in North America, 87% of the total investment will be in, in 5G capex. While in MENA region, uh, over the next five years period, 68% of the total investment will be in 5G and that's normal if we compare the, the, compare the maturity on 5G in the regions. Uh, regions like greater China, Europe or North America are most advanced than other regions, so it's normal to see higher ratio for 5G capex in, in those regions compared to others. So 68% We've seen here 68% for MENA region uh, uh, investment will be in, in, in 5G capex. So how is it, how is it shared between the, in, over the coming years between 5G and non 5G? 2020, this is our year. 30% of mobile operator capex in MENA in 2020 was and still is on 5G. We talk about 9.5 billion US dollars to be invested by operator in MENA region this year and 30% of and as you can see, the level of investment in network will keep increasing over the next year and 5G portion will keep also increasing to reach 81% uh, in 2025. What is the implication of that on mobile backhauling investment? We can see here, here is the, um, the portion of um, how the investment on CapEx by mobile operators globally are shared between, between components of their networks. So the, the larger components is video access network, and this is normal. And the, the, the trend is same as you can see everywhere. So 
in let's focus on MENA region, 51% of uh, CapEx investment of MENA operator will be on radio access network, and 17% of their investment will be on backhauling, and then the other, uh, other component of their network. This is an interesting, an interesting slide. Globally, wireless and fiber-based solutions accounts for most mobile backhaul links with significant regional variation. You can, let's compare, for example, Europe, which is uh, in the left side from 2017 to 2025. We see microwave uh, solution that uh, portion in 2017 was 78-77%. Uh, of the total backhauling um, solution. By 2025, that will be reduced to only 60%. We'll see uh, much more fiber everywhere. The trend is same thing. We'll not see any, any more copper in Europe by 2025. We'll still see some copper uh, links in, in MENA, in Sub-Saharan Africa, but no more in the most, most developed regions in the world. Why the, the fiber is taking the largest portion, this is, this is, uh, this is normal as uh, we need fiber to, to be able to carry that huge amount of, of data our network will be asked to, 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 uh, to, to, to carry. And let's go to see uh, how MENA looks like. So we'll still have by 2025, uh, largest portion will be, still be in microwave almost 76-77%. Um, and then uh, second will come fiber, then satellite, and then, then copper. So satellite will stay somehow stable, uh, less copper, less microwave, but more fiber. Uh, we did, uh, we sent a questionnaire, GSMA, to our members all over the world and one of the questions to that questionnaire was uh, on a scale of one to five, one being not important to all and five being very important, how important are the following factors when selecting backhaul technology? The graph you see now summarizes the aggregated feedback we received from, uh, from members in, in Glo This is Mina. So, uh, meeting the capacity requirement of 5G is the most important factor or consideration when a CTO or a CDO decide to invest on a backhaul solution. solution. So number one is capacity. Number two is reliability. We need a resilient network, we need strong networks. And these benefits are counterbalanced by the total cost of ownership. As you can see, cost comes in second position uh, with uh, equal with reliability. So these are the three factors. We need our uh, backhaul network to be able to carry that, to have the needed capacity, and we need to rely on that network, but also we need to be mindful of our cost and uh, to, 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 it has to make sense when we have to choose the, the, the appropriate technology. Uh, as a result, operators in MENA region see wireless satellite and fiber backhauling solution to keep playing complementary roles in the backhaul landscape in the region. Fiber, fiber will be mostly deployed to carry data traffic in core and intercity networks, while wireless microwave backhauling will support last mile access in urban and dense urban areas and along with satellites, it will support last mile access and aggregation in sub suburban and rural areas where the capacity demand is not reduced. And I will go to my last slide. As a summary, as I said, as I said in the beginning, MENA is a diverse region uh, in terms of mobile market maturity and overall telecom infrastructure development. And this is also true for 5G deployment. Mobile operators in the GCC Arab states are amongst the global leaders in 5G commercialization, but the technology, this 5G technology is still many years away in, 
frontier markets in the region. The region as a whole uh, continues then its transition away from 2G centric services to higher speed mobile broadband services. And as I said also in the beginning, there is no one size fits all technology or policy. All the uh, buckling solution will remain um, relevant and needed and complementary in the region over the next four to five year, years period. With this, I end my uh, presentation. Uh, thank you, all of you. Merci beaucoup. Shukran lakum. Uh, and please, if you have any question, I'll be happy to answer. To answer. I uh, give the floor to our moderator now. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Great presentation. We've we've gotten some feedback already in the chat and the Q and A, and we have some follow up questions for you. Just a minute, so you're not out of the hot seat just yet. Um, we do have, um, you know, some folks who have been signing in saying where they're from. We'd love to hear where you're watching from and joining us from. We've got Singapore and Luxembourg and all over the world. Um, and then um, please feel free to ask questions along the way and be part of our conversation and put those questions in the chat box or the Q. Uh, and in the chat box, make sure that you select all panelists and attendees so we can all be part of your question and, and be part of the engagement. Uh, you can also put your questions in the Q&A, which we've also uh, received a question we have. Let's see here. Let me pull up the question. We've got Ahmed Dewan. Um, he is the CEO of Corcatel in Iraq. And uh, he would like to follow up to your presentation, Mohammed, if we could possibly uh, address this now. Um, the question is to Mohammed: what would be the role of the GSMA in terms of awareness and encouraging the operators adapting, deploying the 5G technology, despite all the challenges they're facing, uh, starting from the huge investment, getting into the monetization, and including attractive use cases for the consumers. Thank you for your question, Ahmad. That's Ahmad Dewan. And uh, Mohammed, would you like to respond? Yeah, yeah. yeah of course. Thank you, Thank you for the, the question. It's, it's, uh, it's a good question, actually. And as I said, MENA region is it's diverse and is, is, uh, is, has its specificities. We have countries that are ready and that already launched 5G services, but we have a whole bunch of other countries. Some of them are now working on their 5G roadmaps, country where 4G is kind of mature now, but we have also a, a third kind of countries where uh, 4G is not even there. So there is no one recommendation. We work closely with, um, with governments, with policymakers in the region. And one of our recommendation is 5G is good. We want to see our region. Uh, we want to see advanced. We want to see um, uh, the most advanced services deployed in our, our region. But let, let's, let's say it clearly. Most of our countries are not ready today to move to, to 5G. There are a lot of things that we need all together to do to prepare to, to pave the way to 5G on, from policy, for example, perspective. So uh, in our advocacy effort, well, what, what we say to our, uh, to our stakeholders from the public policy side is let's work together, open the debate to, to the industry, talk to operators, talk to verticals, listen to them. They have a lot of, they're facing a lot of challenges build together a 5G roadmap, give them that visibility. Where do you want to go as a country, as a government, and as, as an industry? We can support that, that vision, but you need also to listen to our problematics. Uh, we are paying a lot of money for our licenses, for spectrum fees, for tax. Uh, uh, regulation is not fit to purpose in many countries. There are still a lot of barriers, still a lot of monopolies. So really, there, is, there are a lot to do before we move to 5G. We want a, a successful launch for 5G in those countries. We have mid-income and poor countries in MENA region, countries that cannot afford to mistake their transition to 5G. We need to be really careful, and we need to prepare the, the, prepare the, the way, as I said. Thank you. Get off mute. <laughs> Thank you so much for the question, Ahmad and, and uh, Mohammed, for answering that question. Um, I real quickly wanted, before we transition to the rest of our panel, 
uh, Mohammed, wanted to see, um, following up to your presentation is, uh, when will the 2G services be completely phased out? And then when will 5G be deployed in the region? Okay, that's a good question also. Um, actually, we, we started seeing now in the, mainly in the Middle East region, uh, regulators uh, launching some public consultation about phasing out 2G or 3G, asking uh, communities, asking operators what they think about that. What I can see here is the best thing always is to discuss with, uh, with industry, with, uh, with stakeholders in, in each specific country. Uh, of course, we want to move to to most advanced technology, but it has its uh, issues, its challenges. Let me give an example. Egypt, for example. Egypt is 100 million population country, and 20 million people in New Egypt today are using feature phones, phones which are which are connected to 2G uh, network only, not even 3G or 4G. So if you want to move to 5 to 5G or switch off 2G, switch off 2G or 3G in a country like Egypt as an example, we need to be mindful of that situation. What will we do to those 20 million population? We need to give them smartphones. We need to to explain them. We need there, there is there is a, a change management we need we need to be mindful of but and not only that, uh, most of the licenses of our operator in the region are linked to technology. When when they bought the 2G or 3G license, the spectrum they got at that time is linked to 2G technology or 3G technology, for example. So today, switching off 2G means that they will not be able to use that spectrum, for example, 900 megahertz band, in 4G or 5G. So there is an issue here also from policies point of view that we need to, 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 to fix. What I can say is the best thing to do is discuss, uh, list the, the challenges and face the situation and then move, move to switching off to G or 3G, depending on the country. But I don't expect, to be honest, the whole region to switch off to G or 3G over the four to five years. Maybe you will see that in UAE, in Qatar, Saudi, but not more than that. Wonderful. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, we appreciate your question and please keep them coming. We're, we've got the rest of our panelist team here ready to, to answer those questions and we're going to meet some of the rest of the panelists in just a moment. So uh, Mohammed's not going anywhere. So if you have more questions, please send them on in. Uh, now we'd like to invite Imran Malik. He is the SES Sales Global VP and Hamid Nawaz, the SES Middle East and Central Asia Sales Director for their perspectives on smart backhauling solutions. So Imran, Hamed, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Laura. Um, Hamed, uh, can you uh, uh, upload the uh, uh, presentation, please? So we've been providing uh, um, uh, uh, cellular backhaul solutions by satellite uh, uh, around the world for, 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 for quite a long time. Um, and. Uh, Today, we just wanted to share with you uh, our, our, our perspective and what uh, um, um, the biggest takeaway from Mohammed's presentation uh, uh, is that there is going to be a $1.1 trillion worth of investment in the next five years, and this is only in the hardware. So what this basically means is that uh, uh, in order uh, for the operators to recover this investment, a lot of new revenue generating schemes would have to be would have to come in place, and essentially a lot of uh, people would have to uh, be, be be connected. So um, new green field opportunities uh, come to mind. Um, uh, providing uh, better services uh, come to mind. Uh, so essentially, there's a lot of uh, activity that's going to take place. And as Mohammed uh, described, uh, backhaul is the essential part of any, any mobile uh, um, network. So today uh, uh, we look at uh, backhauling from the perspective of, 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 an, op uh, of uh, from the perspective of an operator. Uh, so essentially what that means is that uh, um, uh, the operator has many choices in, when it comes to the transmission medium. Uh, and uh, it so happens that satellite is not uh, the first choice. Uh, and, if you recall one of the graphs that Mohammed had shared with us, it did show that uh, 
um, uh, the share of the satellite uh, uh, in, 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 in the back hall is quite, uh, quite low. So um, continuing on, uh, so from, from uh, um, um, uh, a mobile operator's perspective, the biggest challenge that they have is uh, since, since satellites have to be a bit, a bit uh, 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 on the expensive side as compared to fiber or as compared to, uh, to terrestrial microwave. So the biggest challenge is that they want to make sure that uh, uh, the business case is justified. Uh, so everything that we do uh, is to make sure that uh, we can meet the requirements of the, of, of, of the business case. And four things stand out. Uh, I've been doing this uh, for over 20 years. Uh, and uh, um, essentially, as uh, we have transitioned from 2G to 3G to 4G, uh, four things stand out. The biggest one uh, of, uh, is the coverage. So what do I mean by coverage? So uh, every operator has some requirements to fulfill in terms of some, some obligations uh, that are part of their licensing, and they're required to cover uh, um, uh, a certain percentage of the population. Usually it's in the high 90s, and in some cases they're required to, uh, to cover the entire country geographically. And this all has to happen in a very short period of time. And this creates a lot of challenges. So covering a city where there is an existing fiber network uh, uh, is easy. Uh, going out of the city, a uh, uh, couple of microwave hops is easy. But when you're trying to cover very distant parts of a the country, then you need to be creative. And especially if, if uh, there's limited amount of time. Uh, so coverage is one, one, one key uh, um, um, a parameter that people look at. Uh, and the, the choice of the backhaul medium is to expedite this. And interestingly, coverage is not just limited to countries where uh, the, uh, the or, or, or to the frontier markets as Mohammed had described them, but coverage is also very much uh, an issue in the uh, developed world. So for instance, one of the projects that I'm leading these days uh, is related to uh, coverage in Germany, where one of the operators has, has been uh, fined for not meeting their obligation. The second uh, thing that, uh, that uh, mobile operators looked at is, is the capability. So uh, mobile operators do not necessarily have in-house uh, satellite capability. So they're looking for someone who will take care of their network or the, or the backhaul needs by satellite end-to-end. Uh, uh, against against a very uh, very uh, tough uh, tough uh, SLA uh, because keep in mind for for mobile operators um, the service uh, the network uptime is paramount because any outage directly is is directly proportional to uh, loss in revenue um, then um, uh, cost efficiency is is very very important and why is it important uh, because every country that you look at has multiple mobile operators. So this is great because uh, the regulators want to avoid the monopoly type of a situation. Uh, but in so doing, they have uh, perhaps created a situation where the competition has heated up. What, what, what this basically means is that for the same number of subscribers, there's intense competition which drives uh, uh, the prices down and which puts an intense pressure on the, uh, on the OPEX. So profitability is always, always challenged. So every mobile operator that uh, uh, you, you can come across uh, always is, is looking out uh, to, uh, to efficient, uh, efficiently reduce their, their costs. Uh, then finally, uh, we, we look at the operations. Operations is where the service uptime has to be, uh, has to be higher if not compatible with the rest of the network because an outage it directly results in the loss of, uh, loss of revenue. Um, so let's do it uh, a little bit of a deep dive in, in all of uh, these uh, uh, four different parameters. So let's first look at the coverage. So uh, a mobile operator has, has three choices. They can either deploy uh, fiber, Fiber is very much limited to the urban situations where the uh, uh, capacity requirement is very high. Uh, then the second choice is microwave, which is uh, um, wireless in Muhammad's slide, if, if, you, if, 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 if you have that uh, uh, slide in mind. And then when you go, go
go towards the edge of the network, uh, you have, uh, have, have, have satellites. So satellites are able to provide you with the capability to increase your coverage uh, almost overnight. You don't really require uh, to dig ditches to lay out the fiber or to have very expensive multiple uh, hop uh, uh, microwave networks. And in terms of the reliability, uh, it, 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 it's, it's interesting to note that as compared to fiber and, uh, and microwave, the points of failure in, in a satellite network are, are just three. So you have the transmitter station, you have the satellite itself, and then you have the receiver station. Uh, the challenges are obviously uh, the capacity, uh, uh, the latency is a challenge in traditional satellites, uh, which are located in the geostationary orbit, and, and the economics because satellites tend to be a little bit more expensive. So at SES, we are addressing uh, or uh, three different uh, uh, types of, uh, of, of, of backhaul. Uh, so we are using our multiple uh, um, uh, orbit fleet. Uh, SES uh, operates more than 50 satellites in the geostationary orbit. Um, majority of these satellites are what we call wide beam satellites, which are ideal for broadcast type of application. Then we have three very high throughput satellites. And then we have a constellation of medium Earth orbit satellites, which has been in operation uh, for the last uh, um, uh, seven years. And we've also announced uh, a next generation of very, very high throughput medium Earth orbit satellites. So we can provide backhaul service directly from the tower so just to cover the access. So in the 2G world, this would be a backhaul circuit between a BTS uh, and a BSC. In, in, in the 3G world, it would be going from node B and in a 4G world, you're go directly going from an E node B uh, back into, into the network. Or we can aggregate traffic. So this is not a new concept. Uh, so this is uh, establishing a transmission high site where multiple towers uh, are bringing their uh, traffic, uh, which can then be efficiently um, um, a backhaul using a satellite terminal, or uh, the, the third one is very, very high throughput requirements just for interconnecting uh, um, um, MSCs or uh, uh, core networks. Uh, so this is an interesting application, and uh, believe it or not, our biggest uh, opportunity in core backhaul happens to be in the United States. Uh, which is the most fibered uh, um, uh, place uh, uh, on Earth, or one of the most fibered places on Earth. Then moving on to the capability part. So what are the expectations from the mobile operators? They expect uh, a, um, a native layer two connection. They don't want to be able to uh, waste their time in integrating uh, um, um, a backhaul network into the network. Uh, so we are able to provide um, a native layer two network uh, with multiple VLANs, which basically ensures that we can provide 2G, 3G, and 4G uh, simultaneously. And Hamid, my colleague, will share with you an example where uh, uh, we are uh, doing an aggregation uh, model uh, to support 2G, 3G, 4G backhaul uh, simultaneously for multiple mobile operators. And then in terms of uh, the requirement from the MNOs, they would like to be able to, uh, to support not just voice, but also data. And in data, uh, there are different priorities uh, for video uh, uh, and, 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 and just uh, plain data. And as Mohammed pointed out, the world is going towards 5G. So growth is paramount. And growth, uh, what, basically means, uh, what it basically means for the backhaul is more and more throughput uh, that uh, would be would be required. So we we are able to support. Uh, 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 how many? If you can go to the next slide, so we, we we are able to support two G, three G, and four G. This can be done individually from the towers, uh, or using a geostationary uh, satellites, or it can be done in an aggregation model using our medium Earth orbit. So 2G uh, is not sensitive to latency. Uh, 3G uh, uh, can still, still live with the latency. But for 4G and beyond, latency becomes paramount. And it's interesting, one of our customers commented that the 
worth of a, a, a megabit which is backhauled on our uh, 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 medium earth orbit satellite constellation with lower latency for them uh, it's worth more than the same uh, um, um, uh, megabit that is being backhauled uh, on on uh, a traditional satellite and they compare it uh, uh, in terms of the kpis uh, with uh, with fiber or with uh, with back with or with microwave uh, in terms of the cost uh, efficiencies involved as i pointed out earlier uh, the customers are very very keen to make sure that their costs are are manageable uh, because they are under intense pressure Uh, to maintain profitability and you can well imagine uh, what would it take and how long would it take to recover uh, or break even uh, for a 1.1 trillion dollar investment and another a big takeaway for me uh, from mohammed's presentation is that 2g is not going anywhere so countries like egypt where 20 million people are relying on 2g Uh, just imagine how many more people are still relying on 2G in countries uh, like India or Pakistan or Indonesia. Uh, so 2G is really, really not uh, going anywhere. So how are we able to uh, lower the costs? Uh, the costs can be lowered by innovations, by uh, producing more bits in the same um, um, uh, hertz. Uh, so, so the spectrum is is used uh, more efficiently. so the satellites happen to be our core competency so we are able to uh, we have we have many many innovations in the satellites so ranging from the high power uh, transponders which enable us to use uh, higher order modulation schemes uh, to high throughput satellites so we've deployed uh, a very large network in indonesia which is uh, backhauling thousands and thousands of uh, uh, of uh, remote sites Uh, and then uh, the uh, lower latency which is uh, uh, made possible by uh, our ability to operate a a, a medium earth orbit constellation uh, so this uh, in tandem with the advancements on the ground side the ground segment so we, we we are not an equipment manufacturer but we do use uh, the best in class in terms of the uh, uh, choices that are available to us so th- a combination of these is able to produce more bits in the same hertz and that consequently we're able to lower down uh, the uh, the uh, cost of doing business so hamid has a very good example towards the end of this presentation where he walks uh, where he'll walk you through uh, the evolution of um, a mobile backhaul by satellite and you can then appreciate how technology or what role technology has played uh, in reducing the cost uh, per megahertz uh finally we come to the operations so what do the satellite operate uh, uh, operators bring to the table the satellite operators bring uh, the uh, their knowledge and expertise in uh, in in managing and operating these satellites however that's not enough uh, the uh, uh, mobile operators do not want to have uh, a, a one contract with a satellite operator then another contract with uh, with the hardware vendor then another contract with an operator uh, who would uh, put everything together so they are looking for a one window operation so uh, so one entity is responsible for a, for an end to end kpi and this is uh, what 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 we are providing and keep in mind downtime at a uh, at 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 a base station or Uh, at 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 a node b is is directly proportional to loss in revenue so um um mnos are very very picky about the kpis and the mean time uh, to restore uh, if if there is an outage and also uh, in the in the uh, in the uptime of that site so in this diagram we uh, offer the satellites we uh, uh, provide the uh, the gate paired stations we also provide the uh, uh, the customer edge terminals and we integrate the edge terminals with the mobile uh, um um uh, network whether it's 2g 3g and 4g and in a very few cases we have also gone in and managed the tower and the power as well one case is in myanmar where one of our customers wanted us to manage the tower uh, um, infrastructure for them and another case is in chard in 
in Africa, where we're, where we're managing the entire remote site. With this, I think let's hand it over to Hamid. Uh, he'll take you through a few examples. Hamid, over to you. Uh, thanks, Imran. Uh, I hope I'm uh, audible properly. Uh, perfect, yeah. Hamid. Okay, okay, perfect. So, uh, once again, thanks to Imran. Uh, you have already covered the key considerations for closing a business case for a satellite backhaul uh, in case of mobile operators. So I, uh, I would go through the deployment cases and then uh, I'll, uh, we will deep dive into those smart backhauling solutions which, uh, which actually uh, brings uh, increased revenue streams or enhancements in the revenue streams of the mobile operators as well as reduces their costs uh, effectively as well as give the uh, quality of experience that they are looking for uh, for uh, 2G, 3G and 4G backhaul. So uh, the deployment cases, uh, we, we would talk about the uh, rural or remote site connectivity, which is usually driven by uh, Universal Service Obligation Fund, then uh, there would be a case of uh, uh, res adding resilience to the already, uh, I would say, uh, relatively unreliable uh, terrestrial media. Uh, then there would be the cases where uh, newer revenue streams would be the uh, would be the outcome, which is uh, bringing Internet of Things, machine to machine connectivity, or in certain cases, uh, public safety networks as well. So uh, here uh, I'm just going to very quickly give you the our uh, uh, coverage in the region. We have eight satellites at seven orbit positions for, for Middle East. We have been in Middle East for a, for a, for a long time. We have a full-fledged uh, uh, office and covering uh, the region in Dubai. Uh, then we have got 20 MEO satellites, which uh, were previously known as, uh, which is an O3B constellation. Then uh, we are going for 11 MEO next generation satellites. Uh, you may have heard of O3B and Power. We have got six teleports serving the region, one regional office, as I just mentioned. Then we're providing solutions to mobile network operators uh, like STC in Saudi, Jazz in Pakistan, Telenor Pakistan, uh, Omantel, Afghan Telecom, Oridu. And then we've got a couple of uh, very, uh, uh, I would say, uh, experienced service providers who are uh, eventually providing services to mobile operators like Supernet. So I'll go in, into the example of, um, uh, of geo-based, uh, or I would say a use case or a success story. So, so this is one of the geo-based, satellite-based mobile backhaul network. Uh, we have, uh, they have two 6.3 meter hubs located, one in Karachi in the south of Pakistan, and one in Islamabad, north. Uh, the two hubs provide, of course, network resiliency and ensures maximum network uptime. We've got 82 3.8 meter remote uh, earth stations, you can see one of the earth stations here uh, in the mountainous remote site region. Then uh, uh, the, the the challenges that, or I would say the, the value add that we have brought in into the network is we have reduced their OPEX for their existing network. Uh, there was no need of any equipment replacement and the mobile operator is able to uh, provide new services and which definitely meant 
uh, newer revenue streams. And, and that too, without the CapEx investments on, on their uh, VSAT network. Yeah, so, so the, the problems uh, we, we have been able to also solve, I would say, uh, in, while we have achieved this outcome, uh, there, uh, we, we were able to give the design which matched their uh, high traffic requirements because Pakistan is also a highly pop, uh, it's a very high population. And even the remote areas, we do not see uh, those kind of um, pockets where, where it could be covered by a shared VSAT network. So, so these are dedicated SCPC networks with, uh, when, and when we go into the details, when we will deep dive, we will see what value add we have, where we have been giving, and you will also see how much data we have transported. So uh, if you see uh, what's happening here, because it's mostly 2G data, so it is symmetric, 424 megabits each on, on the transmit and receive side, then it goes through, there is a baseband optimization happening through IP protocol processors. Uh, this adds around 50% optimization. Then it goes through carrier and carrier uh, function, which means uh, the transmit and receive both share uh, the same frequency, uh, goes through to, to the satellite and once, uh, uh, and in case of satellite, it's a high throughput satellite means, meaning uh, that higher order modulation and coding uh, is possible. And hence, and, and this, this goes on, and it, it, uh, it is a connectivity between IP BTS and, uh, and BSE, and in certain cases, uh, E-Node Beast with, with their IP core. Uh, so the outcome is uh, where uh, I would like your attention here. So we were able to actually uh, support a throughput of over 848 megabits in 79 megahertz. And this would, if, if we compare it with the traditional satellites, it was 175 megahertz. So this is, I would say, an example of a smart backhauling solution, which, which, has, uh, which, will def which has definitely reduced the operational expense of the mobile operator, as well as given them the capability to, to launch uh, more services apart from 2G because this network traditionally was a 2G network. Now uh, we come to the MEO part. So uh, again, uh, we, we are seeing here in the pictures, uh, the gate, one of the typical gateways of, of O3B or MEO. So uh, these are seven meter antennas, uh, uh, in Karachi, Pakistan, and you're seeing typical um, remote sites. These are 2.4 meter antennas in, in different cities or towns of Pakistan where uh, the remote, uh, uh, remote sites are getting connected uh, uh, through an, aggre I mean, an aggregate uh, data stream is coming on, if you can see this tower. So, so the, the whole idea is uh, that to economically make it possible for uh, mobile operators to have uh, 4G, especially 4G and also 3G and 2G to be transported over uh, this high, very high throughput uh, satellite link. It, it was essential to make point of presence which, which could be shared by uh, different operators. So, so essentially we have developed uh, multi-tenant, multi-operator uh, point of presence where uh, uh, if we go to the next one, you'll see uh, exactly we have been able to uh, make uh, three mobile operators actually connect to those remote terminals and we are supporting uh, around one point, we were supporting 1.1 gigabits of traffic uh, 
uh, through uh, through this network. And in uh, in 2020, we the, we were able to, or I would say, the capacity increased to 2.2 gigabits. Uh, and with Mio satellite solution, now SCS I would say is competing with fiber. Uh, and effectively, we have increased the satellite addressable mobile backhaul market size with, with this meal. So, so essentially, we not, not only we have uh, reduced the OPEX of, this, uh, of these mobile network operators, but we were also able to increase the, uh, the, the market size, I would say, for, uh, uh, because uh, previously, uh, mobile operators were, were hesitant in going into these newer uh, geographical regions and in a sense to newer geographical markets uh, because the, the backhaul cost was, uh, was, a, was, a, was a big barrier. So there is where uh, we at SCS using both uh, MIO and GEO uh, technology uh, solutions, we have been able to uh, to close these business cases. So very quickly, we go through the mobile backhaul evolution. We're starting in this decade, uh, starting from 2000 uh, to, 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 to present. So in, in 2000, if you could see uh, one E1 link or one two megabits uh, per second link was actually occupying 3.8 megahertz. Uh, there, was, there was some development in 2004. It still was TDM traffic. Uh, it was simple SCPC with drop and insert. So uh, sub E1s was also uh, possible. Uh, and, and then uh, the, the idea was to start small uh, and then grow as, uh, as uh, the traffic grows. So uh, then for in 2006, we were able, uh, we, we saw carry in. Again, this is, uh, as Imran pointed out, we have been, uh, we of course, of course are leveraging the ground technologies as well. So this is primarily about the ground technology uh, uh, development, carrier and carrier. In 2006, uh, from 2006 onwards, we were able to get this 50% bandwidth saving from CNC. Then uh, uh, in 2009 to 2013, we were able to further uh, uh, go and uh, support the higher order mod modulation encoding. And, and one E1 became possible to be packed in 0.83 megahertz. Then with, with IP transition coming in, uh, there was uh, there, there, there was a challenge as well because the information rate actually increased as compared to TDM and the, and the packet size the packet size reduced for voice traffic and and hence uh, there was there was a there, there was more data to be transported. Uh, thankfully, it was uh, it was addressed by the IP header compression, which was possible. Number of packets were too large as compared to TDM traffic. So uh, in any case, with CNC, with combining IP traffic with CNC, we were able to, to do six megabits in one megahertz. Now in 2017, if you see, it's a major shift in both uh, sides. And I'm, I'm talking of, uh, of in this context of uh, cellular backhauling in Pakistan. So that's why I would say 2017, otherwise, uh, with Mio, we had come, we, we had started service in 2014. So for Geo, uh, with high throughput satellite, we are able to I just give you the example of how uh, we were able to transport uh, 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 a large amount of data within a smaller number of megahertz. So, so effectively, we were able to transport 11 megabits in one megahertz, it's a, it's a major transformation. And in parallel, for uh, those uh, for those applications which which actually uh, are uh, best suited for low latency networks of the fiber-like performance, it's it's meal. 
So, so uh, moving on, we now are uh, looking at 2022, where we will be able to commercially, with what we uh, we are on track to commercially launch um, O3B Empower, which will again be uh, uh, um, in in Mio orbit. Uh, but will it will have added features than uh, than our meal yeah so thanks and 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 the, any questions please thank you so much hamid and iman i appreciate uh, your your presentation we've had a lot of uh, feedback and activity in our chat and our q and a section um, really, um, really engaged and and um, really wants to continue the conversation so i do have a question for you uh, Hamed, uh, the question is from Ali Akhtar. Uh, the question is, in the roadmap that you've shown after O3B, I understand that the next big development will be O3B Empower. One of the barriers, barriers that we experience with the O3B is the ground terminal, the complexity and the economics of which do not allow widespread geographical deployments. With O3B Empower, can we expect to bring MEO class of services to the geographies where the current business case is only possible through geoterminals for lower capacities. Great question, Ali. Hamid, want to tackle that one? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, so uh, I think this is a this is a quite a uh, it's 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 very relevant question, very good question. So I'll I'll just uh, go directly to the uh, to, to the product features that. Uh, we uh, we envision for the empower uh, and and the mobile backhaul solution with empower so uh, so we we anticipate that we should be able to support data rates starting from 50 megabits onwards so i think that that is the space that uh, ali has asked for uh, then uh, remote terminals we are anticipating that it would be around from 1 to 1.2 meters and the single tower, possibly flat panel, we will yet to see how it develops. Then, uh, then the terminal cost range would also be much lower than uh, than the uh, current O3B one. Uh, so we believe that we have a play uh, with in the in the space where there's a moderate capacity, single tower or tower cluster. Uh, it would be. Uh, latency and capacity combo actually uh, versus geo uh, and then it would be there there will be an option of or the capability of bandwidth or using bandwidth pooling without reconfiguration so and and of course the in country gateway advantage so so i i i would foresee uh, that we should be able to uh, to support uh, these kind of challenges with o3b empower thank you All right, we have another question, this one for Imran. Um, just want to make a note real quick. We uh, are tight on time. This hour has just flown by. So thank you all for, for being with us this entire time. So we have another question, but please keep sending them as, as we're still having this conversation and the, uh, the team of panelists will follow up with you with answers to your questions. Okay, so Imran, this one is from Ahmed Dewan. Uh, he says, for MONS, it requires a big investment to tie up with satellite services, not mentioning the latency issues in QoS. That's why we tend to be more in preference into the fibers and microwaves most of the time. Will SES consider a revenue share model with MONS where they do all the, cap, all the investment on behalf of the operators, CapEx, OpEx, based on a share of revenues generated providing the service? I believe this would be a competitive edge for satellite providers to improve their presence and would help increase the penetration and satellite tech footprint. Thanks for the question, Ahmed. Imran? Um, Ahmed, thank you so much. I think this is a great, uh, great question. So we are going through a transition. So the first part of the transition is that uh, instead of asking our customers, uh, so we are investing in the hardware. Um, so the, uh, the managed service model that I'd shown you earlier uh, we are responsible for buying the hardware, we are responsible for deploying it, and we are responsible for maintaining it. However, we are asking the customers to pay us a fixed cost for the, for the backhaul. Um, the, the first step in, in the direction that you have pointed out is a model 
whereby we are only charging on, on, on a paper use basis. Uh, I, I guess the second step would be uh, um, a purely um, revenue share model. We are, we are open to, uh, to, uh, to suggestions. Uh, a revenue share would basically mean a lot more due diligence. We will have to be a partner on the ground with the mobile operator to understand the market dynamics, to, to have a role to play in selecting the sites, et cetera. We did, uh, um, by the way, uh, um, deploy this model in Brazil, for instance, uh, where we went into um, uh, the Amazonia region uh, where satellite was the only option. The MNOs were reluctant to go there. We deployed uh, everything uh, along with the local partner and uh, uh, from scratch, uh, we are now uh, backhauling uh, um, uh, multiple gigabits of traffic. But ex excellent idea. We, we would like to explore more with you on this. Thank you. Thank you for that question. We do have a few more questions that rolled in, but unfortunately we are out of time. So this conversation is gonna keep going with our panelists uh, offline and we'll make sure that we'll get to your questions um, in a timely manner. We appreciate uh, everyone joining us today and a special thanks to, uh, to our panelists, Imran, Ahmed and Mohammed for your insights. We do have um, contact information. I believe we had a slide that popped up just a little earlier to show uh, how you can get a hold of our panelists. You can even follow them on LinkedIn and, and reach out there for comments and questions and more information. And again, thank you to all of our panelists for your time and, and thank you, our audience, for joining us and participating with some great questions and and conversation to, um, to, to throughout our presentation. So thank you. We appreciate all of your questions and interest. Thank you and we'll see you next time.